Hello, History 17, 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. We are in Module B, and I will be finishing up Lecture 4 today. I have to say that so far, I've been really happy with your quiz answers, even though we haven't had that many quizzes yet. I left off Part 1 of Lecture 4 with Ida B. Wells and a general nod to Black activism in the wake of the Civil War. Last time, I focused largely on politics, but aside from President Andrew Johnson and radical Republicans as a group in Congress, I didn't really talk about politicians as individuals. I want to briefly point out here that early on after the Civil War, Black men ran for and were elected to government positions. These men on the slide here were all members of the U.S. Congress. This image is from the Library of Congress and is also featured in the YAP Reconstruction chapter. I encourage you to follow up at least in YAP to get a more complete picture of the human connections between federal politics and the realities of life in the South over the course of Reconstruction. Talking about legal processes as well as violence on the part of white Southerners matters because the less power we have and the more danger we face, the greater the constraints on the choices that we are able to make in life. But constraints don't erase folks. Humans get on with managing their lives and navigating their environment, and as they do so, people, ordinary people, marginalized people, shape history. History is neither all top-down nor all bottom-up, but the complicated web of people living in an environment partially created by others while shaping the environment and historical context for everyone else themselves. I'm not going to divide section four of lecture four here into hard sections because doing so would artificially separate matters that were inextricably intertwined but I am going to move generally from family to labor to voting. Part of the strategy of enslavement was to try to dehumanize the people enslaved as much as possible. White Southerners maintained and doubled down on this tactic after the 13th Amendment ended legal slavery. We saw that briefly with the KKK and Black Codes in part one. But many efforts were much more insidious, and the combination resulted in a world that limited and shaped the lives of Black people, but did not, in fact, render them anything other than people dealing with often horrible situations. Under slavery, while unions between enslaved people were welcomed because they often resulted in children who were viewed as property by the white people who held them, marriages between enslaved people were not legally recognized. Enslavers could and did sell family members away from one another for many reasons, starting with intentional cruelty and extending to the payment of debts on the the part of the person doing the selling. Narratives written by people who had been enslaved are filled with the heartache of that reality. For example, from Harriet Jacobs, who wrote under the name of Linda Brint. On one of these sale days, I saw a mother lead seven children to the auction block. She knew that some of them must be taken from her, but they took all. The children were sold to a slave trader, and their mother was bought by a man in her own town. Before night, her children were all far away. She begged the trader to tell her where he intended to take them. This he refused to do. How could he when he knew he would sell them one by one wherever he could command the highest price? I met that mother in the street, and her wild, haggard face lives today in my mind. She wrung her hands in anguish and exclaimed, Gone! All gone! Why don't God kill me? I had no words wherewith to comfort her. Instances of this kind are daily, yea, of hourly occurrence. As soon as they could, after the end of the Civil War, Black people began to search for family members from whom they had been separated by enslavers. 
In many cases, people traveled to neighboring regions to look for family members in person, but it was not at all unusual to place advertisements in newspapers, particularly those run by Black people. These on the slide are just a few examples. You can find many, many online and through ProQuest newspapers on the UC Davis Library website. I'm going to read these just in case you cannot see them clearly. Information wanted of my son Jetson, who was sold about 16 years ago by a Mr. Dolite of Oxford, Mississippi, to a Mr. Thomas Ford of the same place. I have not heard from him since. Information may be sent to his mother, Susan Huddleston, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Information wanted. My father, Phil Gibbons, left Owensboro, Kentucky 10 years ago from Missouri. Also my sister, Biddy Gibbons. It is said that she lived in Jackson, Missouri. Any information about them will be gladly received by writing to me at Owensboro, Kentucky. Information wanted. Evans Green desires to find his mother, Mrs. Phyllis Green, whom he left in Virginia some years ago. She belonged to old Squire Cook of Winchester, whose son was an attorney at law. Any information respecting her will be thankfully received. Information wanted of my son, Alan Jones. He left me before the war in Mississippi. He wrote me a letter in 1853, in which letter he said that he was sold to the highest bidder, a gentleman in Charleston, South Carolina. Nancy Jones, his mother, would like to know the whereabouts of the above-named person. Any information may be sent to Reverend J.W. Turner, pastor of the AIM Church, Ottawa, Kansas. Early after the American Civil War, it was somewhat easier for Black people to move about the South, but as Black codes took effect, they made it extremely difficult for Black people to travel even relatively short distances. Many Black Southerners were forced into supposedly contractual free labor to exactly the same white people who had claimed ownership of them before the war. In your readings for this module, I've given you the introductions to four historical monographs. Introductions like these have great basic information going beyond what I present in class and also give you a chance to think about the arguments historians are making, the kinds of topics that they engage with, and how they go about making their points. I strongly encourage you to look at the Volia glimpse intro to Out of the House of Bondage. Glimp here essentially destroys the myth that there was a private domestic sphere unrelated to labor. To accept the white middle class ideal of the gentle nurturing woman of the hearth staying in the house as reality is to accept 19th century propaganda that define all women other than middle class white heterosexual or at least heterosexual behaving women as not actually women. I feel strongly about this because it still poisons conversations now by effectively obliterating women, especially Black women, who worked for wages outside their own home or who brought paid employment of necessity into their homes from the very beginning of the time period covered by this class. As much as possible in each situation, Black people resisted the efforts of white Southerners to limit and rule their lives. One example of this is Black women who took jobs doing domestic labor in white households. White women who ran these households very much wanted their domestic labor to live in, which is exactly what it sounds like. This gave the employer constant opportunity to watch and control every moment of their Black employee's life. Living in also separated Black women from their own families and children for extended periods in an intentional effort to make the employed woman's duty seem to be greater to the household where she worked than to her own family. Black women in these situations would commute long distances rather than live in. 
In the mid 19th century, a shift was happening in how self empowerment was conceived by the dominant culture in the United States. You may remember that in the early Republic, people had to own property to vote. Ownership of land equated to independence in both the North and the South. By the time period at the beginning of this class, this situation was rapidly changing in industrial regions where factory laborers and even middle managers did not own land. But this was happening much more rapidly in the Northeast and the Great Lakes regions than in the South. For Black people in the South, freedom meant having land of their own to farm, just as it did for poor whites. One of the most egregious actions of the mainly white U.S. federal government was to return large plantations to their former owners rather than dividing them up among freed people. Black people in the South were often left in the position of what is called sharecropping. In sharecropping, the person, or generally family, as you see here, working the land paid for the supposed privilege by giving the legal owner of the land part of their crops, hence sharecropping or literally sharing crops. This was particularly difficult in years when crops failed through no fault of the farmer. Landowners generally kept sharecroppers confined by the combination of black codes and insurmountable debt. I am going to add here that white Southerners as a group went out of their way to create a stereotype of Black people as lazy. This still affects political discourse now on things like social safety net programs. This shows you the power of stereotype when it could convince so many that the people doing the most and the most demanding work were somehow lazy. Part of the rationalization given for not dividing plantations was that keeping them intact would return Southern farming to efficiency and production levels from before the Civil War. The fact that small farms were not of concern if they were in New England, and in fact were even more productive because of the use of technology, and the fact that small farms in the homesteading legislation encouraging white people to move west indicates that this excuse was not entirely on the up and up. We saw in the first part of the lecture that white Southern politicians who had been part of the Confederate government were often able to return to powerful positions in the U.S. government, and this was certainly an important point. In the early Republic, Land ownership had been the basic definition of independence. I've said this before, but the idea was that if you worked for wages, you were not able to act independently. You would, of necessity, represent the requirements of your employer in order to stay employed because you were literally dependent on them. As the U.S. industrialized, more and more white men worked for wages. While the dignity of factory employees was not of the first concern to politicians, the professionals of the growing white middle class also worked for money rather than directly producing food or goods necessary for producing food by owning land. The ability to control one's own labor replaced the ownership of land as the defining feature of what was now freedom rather than independence. Another book introduction that I have given you in Module B is Amy Drew Stanley's From Bondage to Contract. This is also a reading that I suggest you at least gut. At the heart of the new social values of the industrial economy was the supposed freedom of contract. We will look at this more when we look at the urban industrial regions of the U.S., but Stanley draws attention to the way that contracting labor worked to redefine freedom for formerly enslaved people in a way that did not require land, while also placing them in a very unequal position when it came to negotiating contracts. This is a famous print published in Harper's Weekly in 1867. It shows a group of Black men voting, possibly for the first time. The men are identified by type of occupation. The first is an artisan. You can see the hammer and chisel in the pocket, followed by a businessman. 
and a soldier and probably a farmer at the back there. You might want to go back and reread parts of the Black Codes that I included in part one of this lecture that deal with the occupations prohibited to Black people at the state level. Here, if you look at the actual method of voting, you will see that there was no such thing as a secret ballot in the mid-19th century. You had a token, which you put into one or the other of clear glass containers, while everyone, including your potential employers, watched. Both before and after the 15th Amendment, white people in the South sought not only to intimidate Black voters into casting their votes a certain way, they sought to suppress the Black vote entirely. Poll taxes charged voters money for the right to vote. For those with power, the fact that poll taxes also kept poor white men from voting was generally of no real concern. Nevertheless, where those controlling voting wanted the poor white vote, they could use literacy tests to keep Black men from voting. This was not because Black men couldn't read, but because of the way the test was structured. It wasn't the same text for everyone. These are two extracts of the Alabama State Constitution in 1865. The potential voter would be asked to read an extract aloud and to explain it if they got through reading it. At their first pause on an unfamiliar word, they would be disqualified from voting. White voters were given something like Section 5 above here on the slide. If you look at it, it is fairly straightforward and not too much legalese. Black voters would be given something like Section 36 on the slide right below Section 5. It's not just that Section 36 is longer, but that the wording is completely in legal government speak, totally unnatural to ordinary people. There were more methods of voter suppression along similar lines. And, of course, when all else failed, there were paramilitary groups and terrorist tactics used on Black people who intended to vote. This is where I want to tell an encouraging story, because Black people did everything in their power. They got college degrees, and when white colleges wouldn't admit them, they started the historically Black college and university system. Like any other group of people at the time, there were doctors and lawyers and people just making a living. In other words, these people were acting like people. But I have to balance that perseverance with the reality of what happened to middle-class homes or entire neighborhoods. The home you're looking at in the slide has been burned, and the people who did it are posing proudly in front. This was not just during Reconstruction. We will see this practice over and over and over again through the 20th century. It is fairly traditional in American history classes to head back to the higher realm of politics and discuss the failure or the death of Reconstruction. Considering what was happening on the ground, the 1877 election and the deal that politicians North and South made that ended Reconstruction is not any great surprise. As you know from part one of this lecture, throughout Reconstruction, federal troops had occupied the states of the former Confederacy to ensure compliance with laws and regulations governing Southern states' re-entry into the Union. Though the protection these troops provided to African Americans was often minimal, it had been better than nothing. Once he assumed the presidency, Rutherford B. Hayes ended Reconstruction in 1877 and pulled the U.S. troops out of the South. This removed even the most negligible disincentive for the white ruling class of the South who terrorized and oppressed freed Black people without interference from the U.S. Army or anyone else. You can read more detail about the context around the end of Reconstruction in the YAWP chapter on Reconstruction. I've also given you, in the Module B reading, the introduction to this aptly named book by Heather Cox Richardson. It is called The Death of Reconstruction, and the subtitle is Race, Labor, and Politics in the Post-Civil War North, 1865 to 1901. 
This piece reviews the standard explanations for the demise of Reconstruction and then adds on to them. It also provides a picture of both the interconnectedness and the disconnectedness of developments in the North and South that will fill out what you get from me in general lectures. Key points for lecture four. The period between the end of the American Civil War and the election of 1877 in the South is called Reconstruction. What was being reconstructed was the U.S. as a unified nation. The infrastructure of the South was being rebuilt. Don't confuse those. In the late 1860s, and on through the 19th century, the political parties were quite different than we think of them currently. The Republicans were mainly white Americans born in the U.S. and living in the Northeast, plus Black Americans. Overall, this party was anti-enslavement and also often pro-tariff. The Democrats were mainly white Americans born in the U.S. and living in the South, and some European immigrants in the Northeast. Overall, this party was fine with enslavement of other people and also was often anti-tariff. One group within the Republican Party, the so-called radical Republicans, were most committed to ensuring full civil rights for formerly enslaved people and to transforming the society and economy of the South. The radical Republicans did not get what they wanted. They did succeed in pushing some legislation through, including the Reconstruction Amendments, but they mainly ended up acting defensively. President Lincoln was a Republican, hence the party of Lincoln, but his Reconstruction plan centered on readmitting former Confederate states to the U.S. and not on ensuring civil rights for Black Americans. Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's vice president, became president when Lincoln was assassinated. He was, this would be Johnson, a Democrat from the South and avowedly racist. His reconstruction plan was the most lenient toward former Confederates and provided the least, like none, protection to Black Southerners. Under President Johnson, most high-level Confederate politicians returned to the U.S. Congress during or after Reconstruction. White Southerners began a terrorist campaign against Black Americans. The KKK was one part of this. They also passed legislation called Black Codes that severely limited the lives of Black Southerners. Against major resistance from Johnson and white Southerners, Radical Republicans in Congress passed legislation to try to counter the serious erosion of the civil rights of Black Americans. This included the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the Reconstruction Acts of 1867 to 68, and most importantly for you to remember now, the Reconstruction Amendments, that would be the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution ended legal slavery. The 14th Amendment includes birthright citizenship and the Equal Protections Clause. The 15th Amendment made it illegal for states to deny their citizens the right to vote, as long as those citizens were male. White Southerners found ways to work around these amendments and continued to bar Black Americans from exercising their right to vote. Emancipated Black Southerners tried to create a life as different from slavery as they could, given the constraints placed on them by paramilitary violence and Black codes. The so-called private domestic sphere is 19th century middle-class propaganda. Very few women could actually afford to stay in the home. Black women after the Civil War often worked in the domestic space of white families or brought paid work home into their own domestic space. Many Black Southerners continued to vote at great risk to themselves and their families. Black activists like Ida B. Wells were forced to spread their energies across many fights for justice, not the least of these opposing the frequent murder 
going under the name of lynching of Black Southerners, especially, but not only men, by white Southerners. The coda for this lecture is on exodusters, freed African Americans who migrated from the South to Kansas after it became clear that Reconstruction was not going to offer them freedom in meaningful terms. The Library of Congress has collections related to the exodusters, which they have made available online. You will need primary sources for your term project, stage B. Some of you might be interested in using the material that you can find here. I've included the website, but you can also just Google Library of Congress exodusters. The Library of Congress is great if you are grazing, kind of searching around for interesting things. If you want something specific, it's actually kind of a nightmare to navigate, but it will be good for the project that you have for this class. The U.S. National Archives also has primary source material on exodusters that you may find of interest. This is a good opportunity to poke around and look at the different types of primary sources that historians use. I discussed the failure or the death of Reconstruction in both parts of Lecture 4. In the immediate aftermath of the American Civil War, freed Black Americans were able to purchase land, organize schools, and participate in civic life, and they did all of that. These freedoms were short-lived as organizations such as the KKK and the White League of Louisiana began campaigns of violence and other acts of intimidation to prevent people from voting and from settling where they wish. The tenant-style farming of sharecropping that I talked about in the main lecture tied employees to the white landowner. When coupled with predatory lending practices directed at freed persons, many Black Americans in the South pointed out the, that the situation was not greatly different from that of enslavement. Thousands of Black Americans migrated out of the South, especially to Kansas. They called themselves exodusters. Kansas was a practical choice. It's much closer to the South than far off spots like California or Oregon. And for those coming from many parts of the South, a boat or a train ride to St. Louis, Missouri was the beginning of their journey to Kansas. While conditions on these boats and trains were generally challenging to say the least, riding in any form was certainly preferable to walking. Many of the exodusters arrived in St. Louis with few resources and little idea of how they would get across the state of Missouri and into Kansas. The exploits of anti-slavery activists like John Brown made Kansas appealing to Black Americans leaving the South. I talked about bleeding Kansas briefly in our live lecture discussion. John Brown is legendary, and you can find more on him, including a song sung by federal soldiers during the Civil War. But the short story is that he was a white man who fought and died for the cause of abolition. He didn't just talk about it. Many of the African Americans who migrated to Kansas early on, before the 1879 full exodus properly began, came from Tennessee. There, a popular movement took shape in 1874, leading to a so-named Colored People's Convention in Nashville in May of 1875. Many town promoters, most famously Benjamin Singleton, and you can see him on the right there, saw this convention as a way to convince Black people to migrate to Kansas. The convention resulted in the designation of a board of commissioners to officially promote migration to Kansas, promoters like Singleton became known as conductors and began personally leading African-American families to Kansas. The handbill in the center of the slide here was printed by Singleton. It says, Ho for Kansas, brethren, friends, and fellow citizens, I feel thank you to inform you that the Real Estate and Homestead Association will leave here the 15th of April, 1878, in pursuit of homes in the southwestern lands of America at transportation rates cheaper than ever was known before. 
For full information, inquire of Benjamin Singleton, better known as Old Pap, and then it gives the address. And then it says in small print, beware of speculators and adventurers, as it is a dangerous thing to fall into their hands. And then it gives place and date, Nashville, Tennessee, March 18, 1878. So if you were to use this as a primary source, there's a great deal to be gotten from this. The fact that these are the words that are used by Singleton in addressing his fellow freed people, fellow citizens, stressing, stressing the citizens, as well as brethren. And then you could go through and find other things, including this warning at the end. Singleton, a former slave born in Nashville, Tennessee, became the acknowledged leader of the Exoduster movement in 1879. In the late 1860s, Singleton and his associates had urged Black people to acquire farmland in Tennessee, but white speculators would not sell productive land to them. As an alternative, Singleton began scouting land in Kansas in the early 1870s. In 1873, he led a group of 300 Southern Black Americans to settle in Cherokee County, Kansas, founding what would become known as Singleton's Colony. Now, I might point out here that it was called Cherokee County, Kansas for the people who had been pushed out of it. By 1874, Singleton and his associates had formed the Edgefield Real Estate and Homestead Association in Tennessee, which steered more than 20,000 Black migrants to Kansas between 1877 and 1879. And this is, I've labeled it here, but this is a photograph of a crowded steamboat and then Singleton and um, another person named McClure, another conductor, have been superimposed. Actually, they've been basically cut out and pasted on to this picture. The majority of exodusters settled in Kansas, but many moved on to what would become Oklahoma, Colorado, Ohio, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, New Mexico, Arizona, and Montana. I encourage you to go to the sites I recommended at the beginning of this coda to look at maps, land deeds, letters, petitions, and more associated with the exodusters, even if you don't use those as your primary sources, although they are a good set of sources. I'm going to present just one more story here. So photographs at this time were a relatively new thing, and it's not easy to find photographs of any homesteaders, it is particularly difficult to find photographs of Black homesteaders. Many exodusters settled in Leavenworth, Kansas, where the proliferation of photo studios in the 1870s allowed the exodusters and other Black Americans in the community to create a visual record of their new community. This is a street in Leavenworth showing photographers studios and you can see what they had in the way of transportation and pavement or not and street lights. The photographer studios lasted through the early 1900s but as Leavenworth's photographers retired their negatives were often discarded just thrown away. In the 1920s a photographer named Mary Everhard moved to Leavenworth. She began purchasing photographers' archives as they shuttered their studios. And over time, she amassed a collection of 40,000 negatives depicting Leavenworth's early history. In 1967, a collector from Chicago purchased the negatives, selling them off in batches to various museums, including the Amon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth, Texas. You have to request in-person visits to the Amon Carter Museum to view their archives, but I found some of their pictures published online, and I have included those in the rest of the coda. So here, the picture on the left is of James Turner, in 1895, around 1895. So chances are that some of this information was written on the reverse of the photograph. That's how we know it. And on the right, we have Private Paul Schrader of Ottawa, Kansas, 
and three other soldiers from the 23rd Volunteer Infantry around 1895 to 1999. <laughs> Black people continued to form part of the Federal Army. And unfortunately, I don't know which of them is Paul Schrader and which is the others. This is Alice Davies on the right by an unknown photographer. The museum gives a date of around 1870s to 1900s, but the dress that Ms. Davis is wearing clearly dates the image to the early 1900s. The example at the left is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and they dated it 1900 to 1905, and they have tons more examples that are very similar. These photos show the H. Hopkins children on the left and Thomas Meadows with presumably his wife, although it's not labeled, on the right, both by unknown photographers. The photo on the left is labeled Kelly Boy and was taken in 1893. It was not unusual in this era for people to be photographed with their dogs, um, both in England and across the US. And sometimes they're cute, tiny dogs. But in this case, I think the dog is actually larger than the child. The individual on the right is William Jordan posing with a tricycle in 1896. And tricycles, we now tend to think of as children's toys, but you can see they could also be transportation. We have here Mrs. Johnson in 1897 on the left and Abraham Logan undated on the right and with no named photographer. And finally, we have Mrs. Peyton and this is the way the photograph was labeled, Mrs. Peyton and Mother left by an unknown photographer and Harrison Putney's portrait of an unidentified woman around 1910. And again, that can be dated fairly closely because of the clothing she's wearing, as well as probably any notations on the photograph itself. 